Okay, so today we'll look at some applications of artificial intelligence in computer vision and robotics. There's a lot of applications of artificial intelligence in computer vision and robotics. We'll just touch, a, touch on a couple of them to just give you some idea of how the things we covered might be extended to something that people are actually doing right now, either for real applications or what the state-of-the-art research is. So first off, computer vision. So the goal here is to make a computer understand what's in an image or what's in a video stream. One of the most common applications of computer vision right now, or one of the most common things people tend to work on, is object detection. And the problem here is that you are faced with an image. In that image, you're asked to detect certain things. You might be asked to detect faces. Um, you might be asked to detect um, maybe a particular person might be asked to detect a car, a pedestrian, and so forth. Um, any of these detection tasks is something a lot of people are working on right now in computer vision. So here's what's one of the two state-of-the-art types of approaches right now. So we'll look at two lines of work. This is the first line of work. The first line of work has the following flavor. You first compute a feature descriptor of your image. And a typical one being used is a hog, but there are similar ones out there that do something quite similar and have similar performance. But the hog stands for histogram of gradients. So what does a hog do? You take an image. First thing you do with that image is you essentially convert it to grayscale, because usually when you want to understand, let's say, where a person is in the image or maybe a cup is in the image and so forth, the color doesn't affect whether you want to detect something or not. So often it's converted to grayscale. Once it's converted to grayscale, you run an edge detector. This is a filter that you run over the image that finds the high frequencies, where the image is rapidly changing its pixel values. You see the result here on this slide if you run an edge detector on this image here. That's the input image. You run your edge detector. You get an image that looks like that, where the edges are highlighted. The reason to run an edge detector is because Often the edges are more characteristic of what you're trying to detect than what's on the inside. Once you're on your edge detector, you feed it through this hog thing. What does this hog thing do when it comes back out? You get an image that looks like this. What just happened here? Um, what is, for example, this thing over here? That thing over there corresponds to this region of the original image. And what you do is you look at every pixel in the original image, or every region, really, every region, in this case, that region over here, look at that region. In that region, you look at every pixel, and you look how intense, how intense the edge detection is for that pixel and what the direction is of the edge. And so you build a histogram of edge directions, and that's what's shown over here. So within each little square, you look at edges and histogram them over here. When I say histogram them, when you build a histogram, you need buckets. So you could have, for example, um, eight directions, eight principal directions. And then whenever you have an edge, you see what's the closest direction in your bucketing system. And that's where you bin it into. Now, if you look at this, you might say, well, this is quite an impoverished version of this original image over here. But let's see what we can still understand from looking at an image like that. So here's an image that we fed through an edge detector, then through the hog computation. And let's see if we can understand what's in this image. Any suggestions as to what this might have been an image of? I hear bicycle. All right, we see the outline of a bicycle here. We see some kind of shape here, some kind of frame, um, another wheel here, something here. So we recognize that there's a bicycle there most likely. Indeed, if we look at the original image, we do have a bicycle, so we got it right. So why would you do this? Why would you go from here to here to detect a bicycle? Certainly for us, it's easier to look at this image over here and detect a bicycle than it is to detect it in here. Well, think back to what we did in machine learning, right? The first thing we did was say, well, if you want to feed something, let's say a perceptron or a support vector machine, you need to have a good feature representation of what you're looking at. And the role of those features is to make sure that that feature vector, that 
This corresponds to a feature vector, right? In every little patch here, you have a histogram of oriented edges. So you can sequence that histogram into a long vector. So you have a long feature vector here. And the goal of building those feature vectors is such that things that are similar end up close together, and things that are not similar end up far apart. That way your perceptron or support vector machine has an easier time to learn what it means to belong to a certain category. And so what you see what happened here is people have spent a lot of time thinking about what is it that makes an object category, uh, some, some object belong to an object category. Let's say what makes a bicycle be a bicycle, right? It's not the fact that it's uh, red. It's not, for example, the fact that this bar is exactly over here. It's not the fact that this wheel is exactly this size and exactly over here. You want something that is invariant to these things. If you make small shifts, if the wheel is a little larger, you still want a very similar feature vector. If the wheel is a little smaller, you still want a very similar feature vector. If maybe the wheel has thicker tires on, on it, you still want a similar feature vector. And that's what this hog thing is doing. This hog thing, by building these histograms, it means that within a certain region, if something were to shift a little bit, as long as it stays within that region, the histogram will not change. And so by building these histograms of gradients, A, we ignore color, we ignore anything but really the shape of the image, of what's in the image, by looking at the edges. By building the histograms, we make things invariant to small shifts, both in, in uh, translational shifts or rotational shifts, because we will bucket things. We don't, put, we don't build a histogram with 360 buckets, we build one with eight buckets, such that if angles have changed just a little bit, they will still fall in the same bucket. Okay, so that's the first thing you have to do. You have to build a good descriptor of your original image, and you have to do this for all your training examples. Then you can now feed these feature vectors as your training examples into, let's say, a support vector machine. Here's one way to do this. You have a training set that consists of this thing over here. So one big challenge always in machine learning is how do you get your training data, right? It's not easy, or it's, it can be very time consuming to label your training data. So one way to do it is to say, well, we're just going to collect positive examples. And for negative, and those we're willing to label, and we're willing to say, here's a bicycle, here's a bicycle, here's a bicycle, and maybe here's a cat, here's a cat, here's a cat, and so forth. But then for the negative examples, we just collect lots and lots of images, just download them off the internet, and use those as negatives. It's possible in one of those negatives there is still a bicycle, because we didn't check those. But on the average, there won't be too many bicycles, and that's just a noisy example then. And the methods we've looked at can handle noisy examples, as long as there's not too much noise. You can train based on these training examples. That gives you your preliminary support vector machine classifier, or perceptron if you like, whatever you prefer. Then there's a round two. And what happens in round two is now, you go back to all your training data, and you check the negative examples and see which patches in those images have a score that's bigger than minus one. So remember, we'll get a prediction, W multiplied, WR weight vector multiplied with our feature vector. If that's bigger than zero, we classify it as belonging to our class. Smaller than zero, it's a negative. Um, but we want to have some margin. We don't just want things to be just around zero. So anything that's above minus one, so not negative enough, um, but should be negative, we mine those, we find all of those, reinfuse those into our training set, and retrain. So now we have a lot more of those that were right at the boundary, and we can zone in on the decision boundary rather than just have an overall rough estimate of the decision boundary. Now we really zone in on the examples that are very close to it and make sure they fall on the correct side. Here's what you can get with this type of approach. So. These are images from the Pascal challenge. So Pascal is a standard data set. If you want to do this on your own, you say, I have a good idea on how to build an object detection system. You can participate in a competition that's held every year. These are some examples of uh, test images. So one category that's in that contest is sofas. And so when you look at each of these images, one thing we haven't looked at yet is that actually what you see here is you see an red box, and then inside of the red box you see six blue boxes. What that means is actually the system that was being used here is a little more complicated than what I described. It will learn essentially six 
object detectors. One for the bottom left corner of, this, of a sofa, one for the bottom right corner of the sofa, one for the bottom middle of a sofa, one for the top left, middle, top, and then top right. So you detect parts. This can be useful if you, because let's say you want to learn a classifier for a bicycle as a whole, it's useful to maybe learn a classifier for a wheel and a frame and so forth, and that way you can generalize better because now you can have dedicated dedicated classifiers for just wheels and then combine your prediction for a wheel with a prediction for a frame. If both are confident, then you can combine that into a prediction for a bicycle. So you focus on the parts. It also gives you more wiggle room in terms of where the parts might show up. Because now, if you look at these blue boxes inside the red box, you see that they're not always in the same spot. So you get additional room to move the parts around. Here the sofa is kind of detected, but not entirely. Um, here it thinks the sofa consists of uh, a windowsill with cats. Um, here it's an armchair really, not, not a sofa. Um, then here we're looking at bottles. Catch a bottle, successfully detected, that's nice. Um, here is a bottle that was detected, that's great. Um, here's another bottle detected, another bottle. So it often works quite well, but then over here there's a failure case. Um, detecting something inside a license plate, or a picture of a license plate. And then here it detects a orange cone as a bottle. So you can see there's still a lot of room for improvement. This is a unsolved problem. You can go think about this. A lot of graduate students in computer vision work on specifically this problem, how to improve the ability for computers to understand what's in an image. And a lot of them use a lot of machine learning to, to make this work. Cats, um, another popular category. Um, you might wonder why cats and, and what, well, how it is categories picked. Part of it is that you pick categories where there's a lot of images available online, right? That way you can download <laughs> a lot of images and use them as your training data. So CAD, actually that works quite well. Um, then person, um, this is good. So person, people are actually really important to detect, right? Think of uh, self-driving cars, which uh, Dan talked about last lecture. Uh, one of the most important challenges for self-driving cars is to understand when they're seeing a person and to not hit that person. So there's a lot of work on person detection. In fact, the hog descriptor that we just looked at um, was invented initially with the purpose specifically to make it build a better pedestrian detector. Since then, it's been, of course, used much more than just for pedestrian detection. So these people were missed, but this one was found. Um, this one's found. This one's found. This one's found. That's a person on a motorcycle. That's not easy. I mean, kind of cut off the leg, maybe, but it mostly found the person. Cars. That works pretty well. Got, the, got it here. Now, this is a mistake, right? Because the system is trying to detect a single car, and it's thinking that it's found parts it's found several parts of a car, but they came from two separate cars, and it's thinking together they form one car, because it found all the parts for a car. And then this one is good again. Okay, um, horses. This is good, this is good, this is good. That's a cow. And <laughs> this is a part of an airplane. So again, it works. These things work reasonably well, but it's always interesting to also look at the failure cases. The failure cases are the ones that you study, right? If you want to improve these systems, you go look at the failure cases and say, well, what's wrong? You might look at the hog version of this image and look at it and compare it with a hog image of a horse, and if you can't see any distinction, then you know that your features just aren't rich enough and are not going to be able to tell you the difference between a cow and a horse if that's the case. All right, so that's one line of work. It's a very popular line of work to essentially think really carefully about what it is that makes, up for a, makes a category and design features that capture that concept. Another line of work is to say, well, as we get more and more data, um, maybe the data can tell us what, what a category is. So as we get more and more data, maybe we should do less and less uh, kind of clever engineering of our descriptors but just let the data speak for itself and see what comes out. Now, I can't just have a data set and have it speak for itself. You need to be um, still put an algorithm on top of it, an algorithm that somehow can leverage as much data as possible. And deep learning is a line of work that uh, kind of fits into this philosophy where you say, let's come up with algorithms that can use as much data as possible 
Let's make the architecture we build as flexible as possible so that whenever there's more data, whenever there's more machines that we can run our algorithm on, the expressiveness of our algorithm can uh, become larger and larger and maybe start getting close to really capturing all these categories. So some of you might have seen this last summer. So summer 2012, there was a New York Times article about the Google brain. And what was this about? What had happened at the time? Well, um, at Google, the researchers there working on machine learning slash computer vision um, set up a deep learning algorithm on 16,000 machines or 16,000 cores. And running their deep learning algorithm on 16,000 cores, um, they were able to automatically discover the concept of a cat. And we automatically discover what, what they mean and what I mean here is that nobody labeled any images. They just downloaded tons and tons of images off the internet. Um, Nasha took tons and tons of images off YouTube. Um, in those videos, took patches, made them their images. And run a deep learning algorithm, which we'll look at in a second what that means. And at the end of the day, if they inspected the result of the algorithm, which just took in data, no labels, it turned out that some neurons in their neural network were representative of a cat face. Others were representative of a human face and so forth, without any supervision. Essentially, the idea here is that if you build the right architecture, it'll somehow figure out on its own what the concepts are in your data, and they'll, you'll get an automatic way of building features. Okay, so what's the, uh, uh, the building block here is the perceptron. Remember how that works? You have some features coming in. They get multiplied with their respective weights. You sum those resulting products together, and then you threshold bigger or smaller than zero. Now, we saw two lectures ago that you can expand this concept a little bit and make a neural network. And what was different about the neural net is two things. Um, one thing is it can be bigger than a perceptron, so you have these units repeated multiple times. That's one thing. And as a consequence, what you get is that the input to the classifier here, which is still just a classifier, now comes from these other units here. And so what effectively is happening in that first layer is you take your original inputs, compute something from them, which you can think of as computing a feature, and now the new feature representation is fed into the final classifier. We also said that it was important to change the threshold from a 0, 1 output to something more smooth. So these units transition as your, out, as your weights times features go from minus infinity to plus infinity. They don't, they don't abruptly go from 0 to 1 at 0, but they smoothly transition from 0 to 1 as you go from minus infinity to plus infinity. And you can do this with a bigger neural net. You can put many of these together. And effectively, what you can do now is that the intuition here is that this first unit over here might, for example, capture something like there is a vertical edge in this 16 by 16 patch that I'm feeding in to this unit. This unit here might capture that there is a horizontal edge. So whenever that unit fires, it corresponds to being a horizontal edge being present and so forth. This one might be a diagonal edge and so forth. So that's the intuition and that's often what happens if you train these networks. In that first layer, you'll see that they learn things that correspond to edge detectors. Which is kind of nice because that's exactly what computer vision people thought you should come up with as your features, which is you should look at edges, not the original patches. When you go further, you might then find that as you combine a horizontal and a vertical edge, and they're both present, that now you have a coordinate detector. And if you go further, you might have a box detector and so forth. So as you go further from left to right, you get higher and higher level concepts. That's the intuition. That's why people think this ought to work. And this is also what people have observed. If you build these networks and you train them right, which requires a bit of expertise, but if you do this right, you will get these lower level concepts on the left. And as you progress mm -hmm. deeper and deeper into your network, you get higher level concepts. Now, what we said when we looked at neural network training is that a tricky part is, of course, finding the right weights. And if you want to train this right, you might have an output here that you hope to predict. And you, want, you have so many choices for the weights. There's so many weights now. There could be billions of parameters in here. 
which is a lot of parameters to get right, how are you going to find a good setting of those parameters? We said one thing you can do is you can train a neural net by essentially doing hill climbing. You have an error function that says how off is your prediction, and then you perturb the weights, and then you make your prediction again. If the prediction is closer, you keep that perturbation. If it's worse, then you reject it. Keep doing this. Something like that is effectively what you want to do. But there's an issue here. The big challenge is that there could be many local optima, and there could be plateaus, regions where not much changes. For example, if you're in the regime where this is pretty flat here, pretty flat over here, if you're in one of those regimes for a certain unit for a certain input, then changing the weights that feed into that unit is not going to change anything. All right. So you need to somehow avoid getting stuck on these plateaus, and you need to make sure that you find a good local optimum. In practice, people haven't had too much trouble with bad local optima as long as they make their networks large enough. So if you have a large enough network, people have found empirically that you usually, if you find a local optimum, instead of getting stuck on a plateau, you will find a pretty decent one. But the plateaus are an issue. If nothing changes about your network, it's hard to decide, and that nothing has changed about your output with small changes in your weights, it's hard to decide where to move. One big challenge here is also that you might have, in a realistic network, over here, you might have a billion parameters. And if you do a naive kind of, or straightforward training approach, what you have here is maybe a couple of bits of information saying there was a cat in the image. But you're not saying anything really concrete about what you hope to be happening over there. So there's a lot of stuff happening, and then at the end you say, oh, there was a cat, oh, there was a bird, oh, there was an airplane, and so forth. So that's a challenge. You're so much, and you could say, well, we're just going to label billions and billions of images. Maybe that'll do the job, right? We get enough information, but that would be a lot of work. And so often the game is, how can you still do something while not having to sit there for years and years with thousands and thousands of people labeling things? Here's one idea people came up with to avoid this kind of massive labeling task. You build what is called an autoencoder. So we're going to build a part of the neural net, and then we're going to take it from there to build a bigger neural net. So what's going on? This is still our input. This is our first layer in our neural net. And now instead of feeding from the first layer into a classifier, we feed into as many units here as we had inputs, and each of these units is supposed to repredict what the input was. Now this is nice, because now you don't have to label things. What you're trying to predict is what came into the neural net. So this thing here is the same thing as this thing over here. So effectively what's happening is you're kind of throttling things through some kind of bottleneck, some information bottleneck, and then when it comes out of the bottleneck, you have to repredict what went into it. And now every single image patch you can find is a label training example for you because you know what's in, what the pixel values are. So now you have as much training data as you like, more than anybody at these days is able to process. Because you download all images, it's too much for now for anybody to process. Yes? I'm kind of confused as to how it works. So for instance, if we were doing like digit recognition, and you passed in a six, and you have all these features of pixels turned on and off, and then you put it into the neural net, and then what happen? Um, and then at the end, it would be predicting where the So let, let's go back. That's a question about this setup over here. So what will happen here is you have a digit image, which might not just have three pixels. It might have more than three pixels. But let's say it had three pixels. You'd feed those three pixels into this computational architecture here. Now as you feed it through, so they get fed in here, get multiplied with weight vector. Then weight vector times features gives you, that inner product gives you a number that's sitting right here. That number gets fed through this nonlinearity here. We'll make it something between 0 and 1 in a smooth way. And that's now a new feature that you have available here, a feature computed from your original pixels. This thing here will do the same. You'll have weight vector times original features, which could be the pixels. You get a number here, the inner product. This will be a different set of weights, so you'll get a different number here. That number will be smoothly thresholded between 0 and 1. And then you get a new feature sitting here that is a descriptor of your original image. Same thing over here. Then once you're here and you have a new description of your original image in this new feature space, 
you repeat that process. And this will keep repeating until the end, until you have a final set of features on which you would run your perceptron or SVM based classification. Exactly, it's critical to get really good features at the end here and what you get there will depend on all the weights that you have. So there will be a weight vector here, so there will be a weight for the first layer, first connection, first layer, second connection, first layer, third connection, first layer, fourth connection and so forth. So every layer will have a, a ton of weights that you need to set right somehow and that's what we're trying to do. To get these weights right, rather than relying on fully super, full supervision of lots and lots of uh, labeled images, we say an image supervises itself. If we learn features that are such that after you feed your image into these two feature generators here, those features still have all the information that you need to reconstruct that original image pretty precisely, then you found interesting features. That's the hypothesis. And it's been proven right indeed if you use this kind of architecture to learn features, you actually get interesting features over here. And now you can do hill climbing with a lot of training data and this tends to work quite well. And the loss function here, what is this saying? This is just saying whenever a feature prediction comes back out here, compare it with the original feature that you had, the original pixel value in this case, take the difference, square it, and you want that to be as close as possible to zero. So we want to minimize that objective. That's how you learn an autoencoder. This only allows you to train one layer in a neural net. This allows you to train the first layer. But you could, in principle, repeat this. So you learn that first layer in the neural net, which would be, you would have learned, you would retain this part over here. You'd discard this part. That's the reconstruction part. But we actually don't want to reconstruct. We want to learn features. Features are sitting over here. We retain that part, and now every image we have, we can turn into a new image or a new description based on these features here. In this case, two features. In general, it'll be thousands and thousands of features that you'll get sitting over here. That's your layer one. So you feed all your images through your layer one. Gives you feature descriptors for all your images. Now those feature descriptors can be used to repeat this process. You can do exactly the same thing again. And now the layer one features get compressed and re-expanded and you have to re-predict those layer one features. And this in turn will give you the compressed version of your feature one feature, layer one features is your layer two features. You can keep repeating this and kind of over to left to right progress and build up feature layers. The first layer computing from the raw, raw pixels, second layer computed from the first layer of features and so forth. Um, this is everything you have to do. There's a couple of details you have to uh, pay attention to to make this all work um, out right. One thing is often there's some pooling going on, also referred to as complex cells. What that means is that, let's say you have some feature that targets some 16 by 16 patch. You might say, well, really that 16 by 16 patch isn't that special. If I shift one pixel over in the image, that 16 by 16 patch is really kind of the same thing. I should also over there be detecting this for the same feature. And maybe another one pixel shifted over, same thing. And so you have your feature detectors and you kind of slide them over your image and over a certain level of sliding, let's say two or three pixels, you look at the maximal response. So for each feature you check in a 16 by 16 window, sliding, over your image, over a certain region, and see which 16 by 16 region in that bigger region has the highest response, and that's the response for that feature in that region. That way you become shift invariant. If things are just shifted over a little bit, the highest response in that region will still be the same. Another thing you do is that the way I represented it here, this representation seems to suggest that you compress things into less units to then fan back out your original number of units, that's actually not what happens. So actually what happens here is you have more features than your original set of pixels. You might say, well, then the compression is very straightforward. You just copy your original features and then copy them back out and you can reconstruct things perfectly. Well, that's true. 
But you have to do one additional thing then, you're not allowed to do that. And the way you're not allowed to do that is you're required when there's many, many features here that only a few of them can be non-zero at any given time. So for any given image, only a few of the first layer um, features can be non-zero at any given time. So you feed in your image patch. Yes, there's many features, but only maybe a handful or so can be non-zero. And that way you still force it to be a compression. Not a compression in terms of having less units, but a compression in terms of only a few units allowed to be active for every, any given image patch that you feed in. Intuitively, that's interesting because in some sense now you're building some concept. You're saying, I'm abstracting this original image into something more abstract by forcing these next layer units to only fire very sparsely. Okay, so that's what happens. You do this um, and you then do this, let's say, on billions of YouTube images. You then go and inspect, let's say, one of those units at the end. You would pick a unit over here. Well, you look at the statistics of your units. You see, is there a unit that fires a lot? And you might say, well, this unit fires quite a bit relative to the others. You might go in and say, well, what does that mean? You can now rank all your images. You can rank them according to how high this thing fires for a given image. So you rank all your images, and then you rank them based on how much they fire here. It's, and if you take one of those units, what you get out is something like this where you see that that particular unit, if you look at which images make it fire the most, all those images, all those top ranked images are cat faces. So what happened here is that somehow it learned in this neural net a feature representation of cat faces without ever being fed a supervised label that said this is a cat. It actually doesn't know this is a cat. It just knows that if you were to feed in all these images and you want to compress them in a sparse way where you have only a few neurons fire for any given image, then a good way to do that is to have a unit that corresponds to cat faces. There's not a unit that corresponds to human faces and so forth. Okay, once you have features like that, of course now classification becomes a lot easier. If you have a feature that effectively just recognizes a cat face, now all you need to do in your classification stage is well, understand that that feature is the one you need to give a high weight when you try to detect a cat face, and that's it. So you get a really good feature representation here, then the classification becomes a lot easier. Okay, let's take a break here, and after the break, let's look at robotics. It's about computer vision, first half of lecture. Okay, let's look at robotics then. Um, first thing we'll look at is robotic helicopters. Very timely in some sense because Amazon just announced a couple of days ago they might start delivering with uh, robotic helicopters. It's not loud enough, right? <laughs> Thank you. I always think the metric is if it's not loud enough to hurt your ears, they're not trying to get you out. <laughs> Okay, so here, what we're going to watch is a helicopter flying a complicated maneuver. This is called a tick-tock, because it's a bit like the uh, motion of an ancient clock. The question we ask ourselves is how do you do something like this and how do you do it precisely, right? So here you can see the precision. How do you make this happen where it precisely kind of, essentially, is staying in place more or less, but at the same time um, showing off its capabilities to 
um, do that tick-tock maneuver. So how do you do autonomous helicopter flight? There's a couple of challenges. Um, the first one is you need to track the helicopter. If you don't know where it is, you don't know what its orientation is, it's really hard to control it, obviously. The other thing you need to do is you need to decide, once you know where it is and you know maybe what the target is, what you're trying to achieve, what controls do you send to get closer to that target? This part here, hold on. This part here, that's essentially the second one-third of 188, probabilistic reasoning. How do you keep track of something when you don't get perfect information? And this thing here is the first one-third, how you decide on actions when you're faced with a decision problem where there might be some uncertainty. So how do you set it up? So let's say you have a helicopter. Um, the helicopter usually comes in a kit, actually, so you have to spend some time building up your helicopter. Um, you have a remote control. Once you have that, you can try to fly it yourself. Um, now, if you want to fly it autonomously, you need a computer. Um, your computer needs to be interfaced with a remote control. There's a way to do this, so if you buy these remote controls, you'll see that in the back there's a little port called the buddy port. The buddy port is originally intended for if you're a novice pilot. You get two remote controls, and the novice is plugged in the back of the expert pilot's box, and then the expert can take over control whenever they want to. So when, as a novice, you send your controls through the expert pilot's box to the helicopter, and they can take back control any time. So you could use that same port, and from the computer, feed into that port. That way you can send signals to the helicopter. Um, then you want to measure where the helicopter is. So one thing you do is you put an inertial measurement unit on board. What does that mean? It means you have an accelerometer, which is a MEMS device, in this case, if you want it to be small, um, that measures effectively the acceleration of your helicopter relative to free fall. So if your helicopter is free falling, it measures zero, zero, zero. All three measurements are zero, all three axes. Once you're not free falling, you measure how much you're accelerating different from a free fall would do. You would also have a gyro in there, a three axis gyro measures around each of its three axes how fast you are rotating. And you would have a magnetometer which measures the magnetic field but it's attached to the helicopter. So in the frame of the helicopter you know where the earth magnetic field is pointing. And that gives you an idea of orientation also. Note that by measuring the acceler acceleration relative to free fall, um, you get to measure effectively um, if you're, let's say, sitting on the ground, you get to measure which direction gravity is pointing. So you get orientation information. For position, you can't just use the accelerometers because they tend to be quite noisy, especially on a helicopter. Helicopter has a lot of vibration, so a lot of the accelerometer reading uh, signal will be overwhelmed by noise if, you don't, if you're not careful. Um, so for position, you use maybe cameras looking up. You could use a GPS on your helicopter. Um, if you do a maneuver like a TikTok, the tricky part of using a GPS is that your GPS antenna needs to see the satellites. And when you're in a funky orientation, um, that means you need an antenna that's also pointed still up at the time. So you might need many, many antennas on your GPS to make this work. Um, the other tricky part with GPS is that you need to lock on to the satellite signal. So even if you put many antennas on there, um, when a different antenna gets view of the satellites, that different antenna will need to lock on and so there will be some time spent, probably several seconds, if not tens of seconds, before you get locked. So in practice, it's, it's not been done to fly aggressive aerobatics with a GPS. There is no such GPS that I'm aware of that allows you to do this. more practical solution right now is to have cameras looking at your helicopter. If you have two of them, you can triangulate from those two cameras and know where your helicopter is. Okay, to, for tracking, you would then use a hidden Markov model. So the measurements here, the evidence variables are position estimated by the cameras, accelerometer readings, gyro readings, magnetometer readings. The state variables are these over here. What are they? X, Y, Z coordinates, the velocities, X, Y, Z. And then roll pitch yaw, so three coordinates to get your orientation out, and then the angular rate, roll rate, yaw rate, pitch rate. Um, so that's what's used for measurements for the dynamic subdate. So from time t to t plus one, you need some model of your helicopter. Um, so you have some helicopter model, 
and encoded in here, you say next state is a function of the current state and the current actions plus some noise that's not captured by the model, and that's what we'll use. Put this together, this will actually track your helicopter quite well. Then to make decisions, um, that's an MDP. You have your state, you have your set of actions. So what are the actions for a helicopter? You have four control channels on these helicopters, corresponding to, essentially you have two degrees of freedom on each of these uh, joysticks here. So four control inputs. First one is the main rotor. Um, let's say you have three control inputs for the main rotor, one for the tail rotor. So for the main rotor, you have the average pitch angle of your rotor blade. That's the collective control. That's the average angle of the blade as it goes along. A second control input is the how different the angle is left and right. So the angle on the, that side could be a different angle than the angle on that side. And same for front and back. So that's two more controls. Those are the cyclic pitch controls. It's a very uh, ingenious mechanism that through the, throughout the cycle will adjust the pitch angle according to the pattern that you're asking for. Then the last control input is the tail rotor pitch angle. You might wonder why pitch angle, why, why don't we use, let's say, just the engine on the helicopter to, gen, to change the thrust? Well, um, an engine takes a while to spin up, spin down. Um, if you, all you have to do is change the angle of attack of the blades, you can be very aggressive, react very quickly to anything you might want to react to. So changing a pitch angle is very quick. You can change the main rotor thrust, thrust very quickly. Um, you can make it negative, that way you go down very quickly, or if you're upside down, you make your collective pitch angle negative, that means you're in sustained inverted flight. Um, if you change the angle left, right, front, back, what you get is a way to roll and pitch your helicopter. It'll kind of roll sideways or pitch forward. If you want to fly somewhere with a helicopter, that's what you need to do. So if you want to fly forward, you first need to pitch your nose down, and then you can accelerate forward. The tail rotor is necessary to be able to decide where your helicopter is facing, but also because your engine will generate, there will be a counter torque working on your engine onto the helicopter body, and if you didn't have a tail rotor, your helicopter would be spinning in the opposite direction of your main rotor blades. Um, that's impractical um, to fly that way, so you have a tail rotor to compensate for that counter torque. In addition, you can also decide which way you're looking. Okay, so those are your four control channels. Um, one important thing, and, and that makes it hard to control helicopters, is that you have four control channels, not six. You have six degrees of freedom, but only four control channels. There are two uh, coordinates that you cannot directly control. You cannot directly control sideways motion and forward motion in the frame of the helicopter. You just don't have that available to you. You can control the three rotational axes directly and the vertical thrust, but not the two remaining um, velocities. Okay, we have a model, the same one we could also use inside the hidden markup model to keep track of the state. All right, so can we solve the MDP? What's left? Well, we don't have a reward function yet, right? So we need to decide on the reward. That will depend on the task. Let's say we want to hover. This could be our reward function. We have, every, every term is negative because we want to maximize rewards, but really we want to minimize error. We want to Stay as close as possible to x star, to y star, and to z star. So if our current state x is different from x star, then that term will be non-zero, and we want it to be as close as possible to zero. So that's what we're doing with these terms. And then over here, similarly, we want the velocities x dot, which is the derivative of the x-coordinate with respect to time, y dot, derivative of the y-coordinate with respect to time, same for z dot. We want those to be as close as possible to zero. So our reward is minus x dot squared, meaning that a zero value for x dot is ideal. Anything higher than zero is worse the higher it is. Okay, so we can now go ahead and put this together and try to fly our helicopter. So, let's see if we can get our cursor back. So now we know 
know a little more about helicopters, you also know a little more about how exactly this is working, right? You have your main rotor has a negative pitch, collective pitch angle that allows you to be inverted, generate that negative thrust, double negative makes a positive, you stay up. Then to balance your helicopter, if it would kind of veer off, you have the cyclic pitch controls, which allow you to differentially generate thrust left, right, front, back to compensate for any perturbations. And of course, then there's a tail rotor that makes sure you keep facing the same direction. Kind of the, the simplest way to kind of think about something you might have done before and what it takes to control a helicopter is to think of, just pick up a, um, uh, let's say, a tray and put a marble on the tray and see if you can then walk with this tray, with the marble on the tray, and have that marble not roll off your tray as you walk somewhere. You'll realize you'll have to angle that tray in the direction you're headed to to compensate for otherwise it rolling off and so forth. That's a bit what helicopter flight is like. Now imagine that while you're holding this tray that somebody's continuously shaking it because helicopter is a lot of vibration, a lot of perturbations, and there are some heavy wind gusts that can really uh, kind of pull it almost out of your hands. That's, that's flying a helicopter. Um, that's also the reason you should definitely start, if you ever try to fly yourself, have an expert pilot there that can, you can be in the back of their box. Otherwise, you spend two or three days building your helicopter, you fly for two minutes, and you're back to building. <laughs> now, what, what in general should be the reward? Let's say you want to do that TikTok, which is not hover, so it's more complicated to specify the reward, right? So, what you have in a task like that, or let's say a flip, because if you look at that video that we just watched, right, it's magical, and it's, it's great cinematography, kind of starting out, looks like it's upright, but it's not. Um, but all in all, everything that, the only thing that flipped in this video of autonomous helicopter flight was the camera, right? The helicopter was flipped before everything started. A pilot flipped that helicopter, put it into sustained inverted hover himself, and then the computer took over once it was already inverted. What if you want to flip it autonomously? You can't just give a target being inverted because that's, that's just a very complicated thing to optimize for. Um, you, what you really want is a trajectory. You want to say, this is the trajectory you're supposed to follow and the reward is then related to how much you deviate from that trajectory. <coughs> then the question is, what trajectory should you specify if you want to do a flip? Well, you need to understand helicopter dynamics, right? If you don't understand helicopter dynamics very precisely, then the trajectory you're going to specify is not going to be flyable. Because of the exact reason I told you earlier, you only have four control channels, six degrees of freedom, so many trajectories are not flyable. In fact, most trajectories are not flyable. Beyond the fact you only have four control inputs, they're bounded. You cannot accelerate infinitely fast in any direction, so it also limits your capabilities in terms of what trajectories are possible. So, you could write it down by hand. It's actually some work, I mean, what you're seeing here is some work I did back when I was a PhD student still. Um, we wrote down a trajectory by hand. We said, we're going to flip this helicopter, not just hover it upside down, let's also flip it autonomously. All right, so let's see what happened with the trajectory Adam and I wrote down at the time. We then solved the MDP that optimized for staying as close as possible to that trajectory. So it looked promising, at least a little promising. Um, usually our expert pilot would take back control in situations like this, um, but we told him, let's see what happens, let's see what happens, let it go, let it go, we think we might succeed. Um, we didn't succeed. <laughs> what, what went wrong? So a lot of things went wrong, but ultimately what went wrong is the following. Um, when you solve for a optimal control policy in an MDP, to solve for an optimal policy for the entire state space can be really expensive. We didn't have enough computational cycles still now, it's too expensive to solve for the entire state space what the optimal control policy is. So what you do is you pick a target trajectory. Around that target trajectory, you solve for the optimal control policy, and then you say, well, let's, we do that in simulation, and then you go on the actual helicopter and say, let's execute that policy we found in simulation for this target trajectory and see what happens. Now what happened is our simulation of the helicopter wasn't accurate enough. Um, our target trajectory wasn't flyable, and so as we're executing that control policy, it starts deviating from that target trajectory. 
It now doesn't know what control policy to use, really. It's using the best, something, it says, well, I'm, this is the point I'm closest to in the trajectory, but I'm actually pretty far away from it. But that's the best I can do is pick the action for whatever the policy prescribes for the closest part of the trajectory, which is not a suitable action for where you are now. And you start deviating more and more from where you're supposed to be. Your control policy becomes less and less applicable because you learn it just for a certain part of the state space, the part of the state space you thought you were going to visit, but you're not visiting that part of the state space. And then things go bad. What went, what went really wrong then is that it exerted the controls too much trying to get back on track, which meant we had too steep a pitch angle on the collective. Um, too often, like we go inverted, straight up, and every time switch to it. Completely negative, completely positive, completely negative, completely positive. I'm saying, yes, you can switch that angle really quickly, but it really slows down your blades, right? Because you all of a sudden have to generate a lot of thrust, a lot of load on the engine. The engine couldn't sustain it. The engine decided to stop running. Um, at that point, in principle, you don't have to die. Um, if you're in a helicopter and the engine dies, you can go into an auto rotation, which means that you have your blades spinning. Your engine's dead, but your blades are spinning. You carefully control that angle still in a way that effectively you absorb your altitude into blade speed. So your blades will start spinning really fast. Think of, it's not exactly like a windmill, but think of it a little bit like a windmill. Get all that speed in the blades. Thanks to all that speed in the blades that you control your collective, you can still use your cyclic controls to generate differential left, right, front, back thrust and stay level. And you have then all this speed in your blades right before you're going to hit the ground. You switch your collective from close to zero to maximum. Generate all the thrust that you have available in that blade speed. If you time it exactly right, you slow down and you land without um, dying. <laughs> um, if you time it exactly wrong or any, any way wrong, you do it too soon, you get your thrust up there, now your blades are not spinning anymore, and you just drop like a rock. Um, that's what happened here, the blades were already going too slow, there was no way, there was, the blade, once the blades are going too slow, they fold in, the blades were folded in, there's no way to get them back up to a high speed and auto rotate and land for our safety pilot. Um, but keep in mind, in principle, you can. Another really nice piece of knowledge about a helicopter is that, um, let's say you're Let's say your uh, tail rotor fails. For whatever reason, you're in a helicopter, tail rotor dies in some way. What would happen is you would start, counter, the counter torque would make you spin. If, if your pilot is spinning around like that, it's, he cannot control the helicopter in any reasonable way. Um, what he can do, he can actually switch off the engine. If you switch off the engine, the counter torque disappears. So the right thing to do if that ever were to happen for your pilot, and they're trained to do that, don't worry, you don't have to tell them that, but <laughs> they would switch off the engine and you would then go into auto rotation where they would have a really small angle of attack for, on collective that would keep the blades spinning, build all your potential energy into kinetic energy in the blades, come in at the end, change the collective pitch, hopefully with the right timing and make it work. I mean, to make the, way, the way to make the timing a little lot more flexible is that you wouldn't come in like this, but you come in at the end in a flare, so you kind of come in horizontal at the end, so you have a little more uh, room to, to choose when to time that last little bit. Okay, so this didn't work, um, but we, at the time, we uh, watched a lot of videos of helicopters flying, uh, being flown by expert pilots. For example, that's Alan Zabo. If you ever want to look something up, uh, that's really spectacular. It's called, the video this is a snapshot of is called Sunday at the Lake. It's, uh, one of the best RC helicopter videos, one of the best pilots in the world. And you watch him fly and you see that it is definitely possible to control these helicopters and do wacky things like those TikToks, flips and so forth. Um, we said, well, why don't we get one of those best pilots, um, hire them, get them to fly the helicopter for us, and whatever trajectory they fly is certainly a good trajectory to fly. So rather than Adam and I at the time hand engineering some target trajectory, let them just fly it record it carefully, and then see if we can control around that trajectory. Now the one thing with that is that these pilots don't fly very precise trajectories necessarily at all times. Also our tracking system is not perfect. So we don't always perfectly know where the helicopter is. So rather than just getting one demonstration, we'd rather get 10 demonstrations. And if you look at, in this case, I think it's, we retained six of those that were quite similar of an air show. So you start in forward flight, do a half loop, 
to change direction, uh, and so forth. You see these helicopters here being replayed in simulation, but these are replays of re recordings output of our HMM, the state that came out of our state sequence that came out of our HMM for recorded actual flights is shown here. And they do the same thing, not at the same time, not in the same place, but kind of, kind of similar. Um, as a you know, person looking at this, you can see what, or most people would see what the essence is, what really is trying to be achieved here. And you'd hope for an algorithm to be able to extract that essence from these demonstrations and then um, use that as the target. So how do you learn target trajectory? Again, it's an HMM that we use. So um, we would use a dynamics model for the helicopter here. So what is this? The, this here is the hidden state of the HMM. It's the target trajectory. We don't know yet what the sequence of states is that we want to fly. What we do know is that we recorded some no, noisy demonstrations of what we want to fly. Those are our evidence variables. We just now just need to hook them up to these state variables and then we can run our inference in our HMM, get out the state variables that we should be using as our target trajectory. Now, these uh, demonstrations are not equally long. They often don't have the exact same duration, sometimes a little faster in one part, low, slower in another part. So you need to align them. Turns out there is a way to align these. So let's say you fill in the first thing with one of your demonstrations. In practice, really I should put some dots here and call this demo six, let's say. You pick one of your demos, fill it in here. Once you do that, it turns out there's an algorithm that can really quickly align pairs of sequences, not more than pairs. Once you have more sequences, it gets quite expensive, but just a pair of sequences can be aligned very effectively with a dynamic programming algorithm called dynamic time warping. Um, this was originally invented by Needleman and Wunsch for biological sequence alignment. So let's say you want to align DNA sequences or um, um, proteins and so forth, or if you want to align speech signals, that's what Saku and Chiba did, and they call it dynamic time warping. You can apply this to this particular case here. So you would get aligned observations to your hidden state sequence. Once you have that, you can run your standard HMM algorithm, run your inference, variable elimination, or forward algorithm, whatever you want to call it, and you get out an estimate of your state. Now you can use this estimate of your state to redo the dynamic time warping. And so we rerun dynamic time warping, then we can rerun the forward algorithm, get out the state. Um, the forward algorithm, in this case, because we have a continuous state space, it's called a extended common filter. If you also do a backward pass, it's called a smoother. Um, but effectively, it's an HMM. Okay, so if you do that, this is what you get out as your result. All these trajectories are now aligned. And the white one is the intent of the pilot, or what we recover as the intent of the pilot. That's what we're going to try to fly as our target trajectory. Looking at this, you might say, well, is this really better than any of the other ones? It's hard to say. It's in, indeed hard to see on this particular animation, but here's an example of what happens. The colored segments are the demonstrations. The black dotted one is the one that's inferred through this learning algorithm that uses an HMM with dynamic time warping. Okay, so then here is what you get out, the result for the minus. So something already doing to get out. Perhaps other people will come on this helicopter fly also. So for the first 10 seconds here, we've given you this other people have been able to some people are going to be other split S, which is a good chain direction, snap roll, and stall term, but that's where it stops. Nobody else, nobody else is able to do anything beyond those moves. Uh, and this is a loop. If you're really good at doing loops, you can throw that when you're at the top of the loop. Um, stall term is a way of changing directions without going to the other end by climbing and then descending in the other direction. Hurricanes are fast. On a helicopter to uh, 50 miles an hour. It's pretty fast, it's not a very large helicopter. This is the inverted hover. Neither it's fall. And these are the hardest to move. And the reason these are the hardest is because you remove it in the airport and the helicopter to get It's more difficult to anticipate much going to happen in the next one. That's the thing about 
Hamilton. And that's the sustained inverted hover. Now, um, one, one other interesting tidbit about helicopter flight is that this is actually a more efficient way to fly than flying straight up. The reason this is more efficient to fly this way um, is as follows. Well, what's going on when you fly a helicopter? Effectively, the rotor disc is where all the action is at. The rotor disc is pulling in air, pushing it down. That's why you stay up in the air. As you do that, you accelerate that air. And if you accelerate that air, it's going faster coming out of the rotor disc. So let's say you're in regular hover. You have your air you pull in at some velocity v. comes out of velocity roughly 2 times v. That means you generate a lot of friction over the body of the helicopter as you push that air down over the body of the helicopter. If you invert it, you pull in the air at V, push it out at 2V, now the slower air is going over the body of the helicopter and the faster air is just going to the open space. So inverted, you have less drag on the helicopter body because the air is going slower, the air that's being pulled over the helicopter body, than if you're straight up. For this helicopter, for example, the maximum inverted thrust we could generate was 3Gs, whereas the maximum regular thrust we could generate was around 2.6 Gs. So it was a, about a 10% difference there in terms of thrust you can generate. Okay, switching gears, leg and locomotion. Um, flying is fun, but walking is fun too. Um, here's another problem that um, I also happen to work on. What's the problem here? You have a robot shown on the left. It's a four-legged robot, and the task is to enable it to plan a sequence of footsteps across these rocks to get to the other side. At the time we started working on this, this was around 2006, 2007, the state-of-the-art robotic controllers could do a certain set of things already. So they could walk it on flat, flat terrains, but these terrains were still too hard at the time. And some parts people had solved, what people were able to do at the time was to control one foot of the robot and put it in a new position. So there were many techniques to solve that problem. It's actually a search problem. You search over motor motions that will lead you to a good, to a next placement. Um, but then what was hard to do at the time was to decide what makes for a good foot placement. When are you in a good position in terms of where the feet of the robot are placed such that you wouldn't slip, slide, and so forth. So we thought about that a lot and we came up with 25 features. I said, these features matter. They are indicative of whether it's a good or a bad pose. So a first feature is when you're walking and you're doing this with three feet on the ground at any given time, the fourth foot is the one moving, you can look at the center of gravity of your robot and see where it projects down and whether it falls inside the support triangle of your three feet that are on the ground. If it's inside the support triangle, that's good, you're stable. If it's outside of it, then it means you're going to start tipping over in that direction. Just being inside or outside might not be the way you measure it. You might measure it by the margin you have from the boundary of the support triangles. So that'd be one feature. Another feature for this rugged terrain could be what's the slope underneath each of the feet. Now I say slope, well, at what granularity are we going to measure slope? So there would be multiple features for this. One measured at the kind of one centimeter granularity, one at a five centimeter granularity and so forth of what the average slope is of the terrain under that foot. Another thing you'll care about is how much of a drop-off is there near each of the feet? Because if you're near a very steep drop-off, a little bit of slippage is going to be very, very bad because now your foot will slip down all the way. Whereas if you're not close to a sharp drop-off, a little bit of slippage is not as bad. Another thing that matters is the height differential between the feet. You cannot have too much height differential because that's not good for the robot either to be stable. At the end, we ended up with 25 features. And we said, to come up with a good foot placement, really what we should be doing is um, somehow trading off these features. We can compute a score. For any possible pose of the robot on the terrain, we can have compute those features, then multiply with some weights W and get a score. And one way to get the weights W is to hand tune them. You just think, well, margin from the support triangle is maybe a weight of one, then high differential is maybe a weight of 20. You kind of tweak things and you see what happens. Um, but that's turned out to be pretty hard to do. We couldn't really come up with satisfactory weights. If you have two or three weights, that might work well. If once you have 25, it's a lot to tune. So the challenge here was to come up with this score, this reward function that indicates how good a foot placement is. Um, here's what we did. We said, let's just teach it. 
what a good food placement is. You demonstrate the robot across the terrain. Then you run apprenticeship learning. There's a learning missing there, but you run apprenticeship learning to um, learn a reward function. What does that mean? You can say, well, every time we demonstrated a placement of the robot on that terrain, that means that placement is better than any nearby placement. Otherwise, we would have picked that better nearby placement. Because that gives you information about the weights. You can put that in an optimization problem and get out a set of weights that explains the path we demonstrate as the right path to get across, the one that maximizes reward. Then when you get a new terrain, you can compute for every possible pose of the robot on the new terrain what the reward would be. Then you can do planning, find a path across, sequence of foot placements, and then execute that sequence of foot placements. Okay, here's what happens if you set the weights just all equal to zero, so you don't really distinguish between the different uh, poses. Every pose is equally good, according to this planner. You can see we put a lot of effort in, in the low-level control to for it to get unstuck, but once your foot placements are just too bad, you won't succeed on a train like this. Um, here's what happens if you Perfect. plan using the learn reward function. So you find an optimal sequence of footsteps relative to the learn reward function. The feet are still slipping and sliding at times. That's unavoidable with this kind of robot, this kind of terrain. And you'll see that whenever the feet slip or slide, it's not a not having bad consequences, and it gets across very quickly. Now, one interesting thing here is that we always think about there's train, right? You do training, you do cross-validation to tune some hyperparameters of your learning algorithm, then there's test data that you don't get to see. You evaluate on only at the end to see how good your thing was. In this case, the testing was real, real testing, in that this was part of a project where DARPA, which is an agency, a defense agency that funds a lot of research, um, they would not tell us what terrain the robot has to get across. They would build a new terrain, not tell us what it is, tell us, send us your code, and the robot will be faced with that terrain and we'll get a scan of the terrain so it knows the height map, and it'll just have to plan without you being able to do anything as that testing terrain gets put in front of the robot. So you really, really get true testing here where at the time we were learning the reward function, we didn't even know what the testing terrain was going to be. Of course, we had some idea. We knew it was going to be a rugged terrain, and we made a lot of terrains ourselves that were somewhat similar to these to be representative of what we expect to see. Um, but we didn't actually get the testing terrain um, until the robot actually ran over that terrain. Okay, a whole other field of robotics is personal robotics. It's actually, for myself, one of the main things I'm working on right now. Um, the idea here is, well, who wouldn't want a robot butler taking care of all your household chores, cooking for you, dusting things, and so forth, right? Um, well, a few years ago, this video surfaced. There's a video from um, 2006. Um, Once you have kids, this one might be more applicable. Um. Okay, why? Well, I mean, this is amazing, right? I mean. <laughs> So this is amazing. You um, have a robot doing all these chores, in including you know, serving beer to the student who worked on the project. Um, but there's a catch. Um, one of the students working on this project built a harness, is sitting inside this harness, and every single motion that robot is making, the student is orchestrating by making that motion themselves inside the harness, 
which has encoders that can measure the student's motions, and then they're translated onto the robot motion, and some pedals to uh, wheel it around. So what this is showing, though, is that if we could just build the artificial intelligence, we'd be there, because this robot with the right artificial intelligence could do a lot of the chores we want robots to do. Um, that doesn't mean it advances in mechanical aspects of the robot can help us and make it a little easier to build the software, right? If it had nicer hands, for sure it'd be easier to program the robot than with these somewhat you know, limited hands and so forth. But this does give us a proof of concept that if we can build the artificial intelligence and put it on this robot, it can do the chores for us. So this was teleop. Um, what happened then, these were some student, these were students um, in Ken Salisbury's lab at the time. They took their projects out of, out of the lab, um, ended up um, making it part of a company called Willow Garage. Willow Garage was dedicated to kind of advancing robotics by taking that PR1 robot that you saw, building the next generation of that, uh, one that's more robust, not a lab prototype, but kind of a more um, robust version that can be, many of them can be produced and distributed to other research labs. So um, if you looked at robotics at the time, very few research labs had a really nice robots, and whenever they had, they had to build it themselves. Willow Garage took it up on themselves to make better versions of that PR1 called PR2, distributed into many labs so people could focus on the AI rather than on building the robot. And so at Berkeley, we got one of those robots, um, one of those PR2s, and this is something we did with the PR2. So here's some work. What's going on here? Well, um, the challenge here is to deal with, in general what we look at is, Look at where are robots right now. Where do you see a lot of robots? You see a lot of robots in manufacturing. And the reason you see a lot of robots, something's not playing exactly right here. Hmm. Okay, so the reason you see a lot of robots in manufacturing is because they can go through the same motion over and over, and the engineers put a lot of cleverness in what's around the robot to make this work. That same motion over and over actually is an economically productive thing to do. In households, that's rarely the case. The same motion over and over will rarely succeed. Um, and so what we're looking at here is kind of the other end of the spectrum where if you look at, let's say, laundry folding, even folding the same article, when it's presented to you on, as a pile, it's going to require a different set of motions than the previous time. Um, video is not 200x here. It's something about it is slowed down, actually. Not sure what's happening with the playing back, but um, what you see here is the robot is inspecting the towel. It's looking for corners, so it's using computer vision to find the corners of this towel. Once it finds a corner, it's inspecting the towel again to find another corner that's a neighboring corner. Once it's found a neighboring corner, it checks if there's any twist at the top. If there's any twist at the top, it untwists it. Then it goes to the second table, and then it goes to a um, pre-motion plan sequence of motions that will fold it nicely and put it away. So this is 200x, but 200x divided by a large factor. Okay, here's another thing we did. Again, here we used uh, machine learning to classify. So we presented a robot with a lot of socks ahead of time, labeled them as inside out or right side out. The features we used were called local binary patterns. It's a feature descriptor that's representative of the local texture of, of, of a textile. And based on those feature descriptors, we could classify whether they're inside out or not. If it's inside out, it needs to flip the sock to get it right side out, and then it needs to pair them up here. All right. One other big thing that's going on in robotics right now is called the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Um, let me tell you a little bit about that. So what's going on? Um, this is a big challenge. There's a big prize associated with it. In fact, a $2 million prize in November 2014. These are the Petman robots. In the very first lecture, uh, Dan showed you the Petman robot. It looks a bit like a Terminator with a blue light on his chest. Um, many teams have this robot. Many teams build their own robot. And the challenge will be to solve kind of a disaster response scenario, like the, what happened at Fukushima in Japan, the nuclear disaster there where the nuclear reactor kind of was going astray and they had to send in people to fix it. But those people were getting radiated on and will die much sooner than they otherwise would have died. They essentially sacrificed their lives to save many other lives, um, which hopefully with a better robotic system in the future can be avoided and we can send in robots 
that can do things like driving a car on, the prop on such a nuclear facility, um, get out of it, open a door, enter the building, climb a ladder to get to a difficult to reach place, um, maybe use a tool to break a panel, uh, locate some buttons on the panel, push them, rotate a valve, close the valve and so forth, um, replace a cooling pump, those are the kind of things that they're interested in and that's what the challenge is about. So what happened is about a year ago the challenge started. The first part of the challenge was in simulation. There's a simulated environment of this challenge in which many teams participated. I think about 50, 40, 50 teams participated. The top six teams received one of those Petman, now called Atlas robots, built by Boston Dynamics. And then other teams could still participate um, building their own robot. Um, and now all those teams are competing a year from now in the final competition where it will be the real robot trying to solve these problems. Um, when we think of this thing back to what, what you saw for the autonomous cars, right? Back in 2005, um, there was a self-driving car challenge also set up by DARPA, same agency. First time, nobody succeeded. Same thing might happen here. Same thing might happen that the first time around, nobody really completes that challenge. But it'll really kind of make it clear what's still hard to do, what's feasible, and allow people to zone in on the harder parts. And maybe just like with the cars, a few years later, actually succeed at some of these really hard tasks. All right, what's left for us? Next lecture, what we're going to look at is AI for games. We're going to look at the final contest results and where to go next beyond 188 if you want to learn more about artificial intelligence. See you on Thursday.